Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again everyone. This is the third and final part of microbial growth. Uh, this is lecture number 51 of module 10. Here we are going to look at the factors that affect microbial growth. So uh, we are going to look at the factors that affect microbial growth. We have already seen the factor um, of nutrient availability. We have gone through the law of the minimum. So we will now move to temperature pH osmotic effects which can also be considered ionic strength or water availability or water activity and finally oxygen. Let us take a look at temperature. How does it make a difference to the growth of bacteria or any other organism? Now what you see over here is a schematic that shows you the relationship between temperature and growth rate. We know from experimental proof that when you increase the temperature, the rate of growth will increase up to a particular point. Now you know from chemistry, uh, chemical reactions, chemical kinetics, you know from Arrhenius's law that when you increase the temperature, the rate of the chemical reaction increases. So what is biological uh, reaction? Biological reactions are nothing but the sum total of various biochemical reactions. They are subject to the same uh, principles or the same fundamental law that as the in, uh, temperature increases, the kinetics of the biological reactions will increase. So they will increase up to a certain point. If you go beyond that point, then there is damage to the cells. So let us like take a look at how it works for biological systems. So here we have a minimum. Now we know from refrigerating food, we know that we do not get too much bacterial growth in the freezer. So if you put some food in the freezer, it will stay there for weeks or maybe even months without getting spoiled. So why is bacterial growth not happening at those temperatures? For the simple reason that the membranes have gelled, the transport processes that are essential for bacterial growth and reproduction are slow and they are so slow that they are practically negligible and you get no spoilage of food at that point. As you increase the temperature, if you leave something out at room temperature, what will happen? Room temperature is where these bacteria which are present in your environment are going to enter the food and they will re reproduce rapidly because the nutrients are high in your food and that is where the enzymatic reactions that are controlling these biochemical reactions will occur at very high rates and that is what you see in the this part of the curve. So these are Enzyme reactions, they are all, remember all biochemical reactions are enzyme mediated reactions. They are all occurring at faster rates as the temperature increases. We have also seen that one of the major factors that causes denaturation of proteins is high temperature. There comes a point at which the proteins that are part of the uh, cell are going to be denatured. At this point, you will get protein denaturation, you will get collapse of the plasma membranes and you may get thermal lysis. So at this, when this optimum point has been crossed, optimum is defined as the point at which the growth rate is maximum. So beyond that point, the growth rate starts coming down and that is because damage starts becoming apparent. So the cells are being damaged, the enzymes are being damaged, the cell wall may be damaged and so on. So at that point there will be a maximum 
if you keep increasing the temperature there will be a maximum at which the cells will be destroyed and that is thermal lysis so these are the three cardinal temperatures so you have minimum optimum and maximum and you will find that these three cardinal points are there for practically every environmental factor that determines the growth conditions for any given organism so when we think about food preservation the best example of or rather i should say the most relevant application of microbiology is temperature so why do we use refrigerators why do we keep food at either uh, refrigerated conditions or freezing uh, <laughs> freezing or frozen conditions so when you have sub zero conditions for the bacteria that are in our environment in our normal environment under room condition those bacteria are not capable of growing under sub zero condition so minus 30 to 0 the food is safe it cannot survive and therefore these bacteria cannot survive and the food will not spoil 0 to 5 degrees this will uh, this is perhaps close to your freezer uh, temperature some bacteria may be present within the food because not all food is sterilized and if they are present they may grow and therefore they will spoil but they will spoil over a, they will cause spoilage of food over a very long period of time now the lower part of the fridge which is not the freezer which is not frozen where you don't get ice in that part the temperature may be anywhere from 5 to 16 to 20 degree centigrade at this point the bacteria are there in the food unless it's been sterilized and if they are there they will cause spoilage of food but over a period of maybe a week or so or even shorter depends on the nature of the food depends on the temperature in the refrigerated portion of your fridge all that will determine what happens if you leave it at room temperature assuming your room temperature is anywhere from 25 to 35 degrees centigrade depending on where you are you will get rapid growth of bacteria in conditions in our country we have room temperatures that vary anywhere from let's say 15 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade this is dangerous in terms of food so food spoils very easily if it is not refrigerated it will not even survive maybe 24 hours i know that cooked food cannot survive even 24 hours under room temperature conditions and the bacteria or the fungi and so many other organisms that can grow on the food and these conditions they can be pathogenic in fact pathogenic bacteria tend to grow most at the, under these conditions some of them may produce toxins these can be endotoxins or exotoxins they can cause food poisoning so this is the danger zone so leaving food out and then consuming it later is extremely dangerous from a health perspective if you increase the temperature further from 52 to 62 degrees centigrade you will find that the number of bacteria that are continuing to live in those samples you can try it with milk you can try it with any other liquid uh, material that are um, uh, food materials you will find that the concentration of bacteria and other organisms will go down and finally if you take it past boiling point you can be pretty certain that the pathogenic bacteria in your environment will not survive these conditions so you can boil milk you can boil water and feel safe that pathogenic bacteria are not going to be able to survive these high temperatures and therefore consuming that material is safe and that is what pasteurization is all about we'll come to that again now we come to temperature classes what we see in this table is that bacteria have been classified according to their optimum temperature in the previous slide i mentioned that uh, bacteria that are uh, in our environment they are used to living in perhaps an optimum temperature of about 35 to 39 degree centigrade and a range of 10 to 48 degree centigrade these are mesophilic bacteria so 
when your food is exposed to these mesophilic bacteria it's not it will spoil under normal conditions within these conditions if these are the temperature conditions your food will spoil when you put it in the fridge even if these bacteria are present in the food they will not be able to multiply that does not mean that bacteria do not exist in arctic or antarctic uh, regions those are psychrophilic or psychrotrophic bacteria psychrophilic bacteria have an optimum temperature of 4 degree centigrade and a growth range of minus 8 to 18 degree centigrade psychrotrophic bacteria have 20 degree optimum temperature and 0 to 30 degree range of growth temperatures these are bacteria that can and uh, can and do exist in arctic as well as antarctic regions or even higher altitude regions where there is very low temperature like the himalayas and so on so these are where you can find these bacteria now these bacteria do not exist in your normal environment then we come to thermophilic bacteria thermophilic bacteria have an optimum of 60 degrees centigrade and a range of 40 to 72 degree centigrade there is another group of bacteria hyperthermophilic bacteria which have an optimum of 90 to 95 degree centigrade and a growth range of 65 to 110 degree centigrade temperature so if i were to ask you can bacteria survive under boiling water conditions the answer is the mesophilic bacteria that live in our environment cannot survive under those con boiling water conditions. However, if you find bacteria in boiling water springs or in hot water springs, they may be thermophilic bacteria and they are definitely capable of surviving under high temperature conditions. These are all archaeobacteria. We have seen examples of that and uh, they are not likely to be pathogenic in any conditions because they, their optimum growth conditions are very different from our uh, body temperature conditions. So they are unlikely to use us as hosts. Here we see lichen. You know that lichen is a mutualistic relationship between algae and fungi. And the, this is a photosynthetic lichen, which is growing at minus 24 degree centigrade this is thick snow which is covered with algae so it's not just bacteria that can be psychrophilic you can have algae growing in arctic as well as antarctic regions and this is uh, another graphic that shows you algae in antarctic regions what is the upper limit for different living organisms now let's take a look at that fish and aquatic vertebrates have an upper limit of 38 degree centigrade insects can survive higher temperatures 45 to 50 degree centigrade crustaceans the ones with shells can survive even higher temperatures 50 to 59 degree centigrade plants are generally more sensitive vascular plants need uh, they cannot survive beyond 45 degree centigrade for one species it was 60 degree centigrade moss which is a type of plant has an upper limit of 50 degree centigrade eukaryotic microorganisms protozoa 56 degrees algae 55 to 60 degree centigrade fungi 60 to 62 degree centigrade uh, bacteria as you can see have much higher upper limits upper temperature limits compared to all the other organisms cyanobacteria can survive 73 degree centigrade and oxygenic Phototrophs can survive to the same extent. Chemoorganotrophs and chemolithotrophs are, uh, they can survive up to 95 degree centigrade. Archaeobacteria can survive far beyond that. They can tolerate even 122 degree centigrade. So here are some examples of thermophilic bacteria in a hot water spring. This is a hot water spring from the Yellowstone National Park. The colors are due to the combination of algae, bacteria and archaea. Let's now come to the next environmental factor and that is pH. So in the table, you see the pH scale all the way from 0 to 14. You know what that means in terms of the concentration of protons and hydroxide ions. and 
in terms of the classes of bacteria or other microorganisms that can survive. So, if the organism can tolerate acidic conditions, it's called an acidophilic organism or a bacteria. If it can survive basic conditions or high pH conditions, it's called an alkali file. So, from the environmental perspective, some of the things that are very important for us are uh, the acidophilic bacteria. These are found in volcanic soils, in acid mine drainage, in certain types of food, in certain types of soil, in cheese, in peas. These are some of the foods as well as other types of environments where you're likely to find acidophilic bacteria. Uh, also keep in mind that generally we pickle food and the reason for pickling food is that again the normal species that we see around us are not going to withstand, they cannot withstand the low pH of uh, acidic, um, the acidic pH of pickles and so on and that's why pickling food helps to preserve the food for a long period of time. Um, so we know neutral is 7 and that's what we try to do most of our work at and very often we see deviations in this pH in the environment just like acid mine drainage or soda lakes and uh, alkaline lakes and so on, seawater which is on the basic, the alkaline side of the scale. So these are um, areas where you are likely to find deviations from neutral conditions and under those conditions it does not mean that bacteria and other organisms cannot survive. You will find certain species that are capable of surviving under those conditions. Then we come to the next one and that is osmotic effects and these osmotic effects like I said to you in a previous lecture that they are related to the ionic strength in the solution versus the ionic strength within the cell. So let's take a look at another parameter that is used to define the activity or ionic strength. I've used the word ionic strength in a previous lecture. Another parameter that is used in the textbook is water activity. This water activity can be compared relative to pure water. So there are certain uh, organisms which can survive in pure water. In general, most organisms do not want to survive in pure water because they need the salts and minerals that are present in water. So the ionic strength generally is higher and therefore the water activity is lower. So pure water which has an activity of 1 does allow certain bacteria to survive, Coelobacter and Spirulum. Human blood doesn't have very low water activity compared to pure water, it's 0.995 and Streptococcus, E. coli and several pathogenic organisms are capable of surviving under those conditions. Sea water is much higher in ionic strength and much lower in water activity, it's 0.98, Pseudomonas, Vibrio, Vibrio cholerae, famous for causing cholera, can survive under high ionic strength or low water activity. Our foods, breads, maple syrup, fruit cakes and so on, all these are very low uh, ionic, uh, I'm sorry, very low water activity and high ionic strength ranging from 0.95 all the way to 0.8 and several different types of pathogenic as well as other bacteria can be found. Salt pans, we have seen that uh, you can have bacterial growth under salt pan like conditions. So the water activity in salt lakes and salted fish in salt pans can be very low, which means the ionic strength or the salt concentration is very high. So that is 0.75, you get halobacterium, halococcus, I'll come back to this point again. And you can see dry fruits, dry fruits, cereals, candies, they have very low moisture content. The water activity is as low as 0.7 and there are fungi and bacteria that can survive under these conditions as well. In terms of halophilic organisms, salt tolerance of certain organisms is very high. So when we think about salt water, we generally think of seawater. Seawater has a salt concentration of 3.5% NaCl. 
So when we think about E. coli and Pseudomonas, which are common bacteria found in our environment, these are non-halophilic bacteria. In terms of salt concentration, they want a salt concentration less than 0.2 molar salt concentration. Halo tolerant bacteria are the ones that can grow in high salt concentration or without salt. So that is Staphylococcus aureus. Halophilic bacteria are the ones that you can that can withstand seawater concentrations which is 2 to 20 percent seawater is 3.5 percent so these halophilic bacteria are likely to be found in marine environments so you have vibrio fisheri and so many other types of vibrio uh, species then we have extreme halophilic bacteria they can withstand 15 to 30 percent salt concentration now this kind of salt concentration is found only in salt pans and the textbook has several textbooks have photos of salt pans which are colored and that shows the presence of certain types of bacteria and algae that are salt tolerant they are extremely halophilic organisms this is an example of Halobacterium salinarum. So they, there are organisms on the planet that can withstand extremely high salt concentrations. And you can see another graph from a paper and you can see the salinity levels as well as the uh, examples of halo tolerant as well as halophilic uh, bacteria and algae. So there are, yeah. So there is a protozoa, yes. So this is um, a, a slide that shows you compatible solutes. Compatible solutes are organic or inorganic compounds that are synthesized by cells to increase the amount of water that they can withdraw from the environment. Now by increasing the salt concentration within the cell, they can uh, cause the concentration gradient of water from the environment will be higher and that will allow them to bring in water from the environment. So these compounds have to be non-inhibitory to the cells obviously otherwise they won't be able to survive. So we have cyanobacteria, we have algae, we have bacteria, archaeobacteria, yeast, fungi, all of them are capable of doing, uh, of creating these types of solutes. We then come to the last part and that is oxygen. Here we see the clustering of different types of bacteria in response to an oxygen gradient, oxygen concentration gradient. So you have five different test tubes. The oxygen concentration is going to be highest at the surface. So aerobic bacteria that are are likely to be clustering at the surface. So whatever you see at the surface or closest to the surface are aerobic bacteria. Then in the second one, you have bacteria that are as far away from oxygen as possible. Oxygen being highest at the surface and as you go further down in the test tube, you're likely to have lower and lower oxygen concentrations as long as it's not mixed. If it's mixed then obviously it's uniformly distributed. So if it's a not mixed test tube then anaerobic bacteria are likely to cluster at the bottom. Then we come to a uniform distribution of bacteria. If they are uniformly distributed throughout the test tube they are likely to be facultative which means it doesn't matter what the oxygen concentration is they are capable of surviving under both aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions. We then come to a very interesting phenomenon shown in tube number four. Here the bacteria have clustered a few uh, few layers let's say below the surface they are not at the surface it's not like tube one here they are clustering not at the bottom but somewhere in between just below the surface these are micro aerophilic bacteria which means they want extremely low levels of oxygen they are uh, they do want oxygen but very low levels and then you have aerotolerant anaerobic bacteria. Now in the second case, these are anaerobic bacteria because they are going far away from oxygen. They are strictly anaerobic or what we call obligate anaerobes. 
In the last case, in number 5, these are aerotolerant anaerobes which are capable of growing regardless of whether there is oxygen or not. They don't utilize the oxygen. They will not utilize the oxygen, but they can tolerate the presence of oxygen in their environment. Now, having seen that there are several different groups of bacteria and they all respond to the presence of oxygen in very different ways, it's also important to realize that in aerobic so there are many different issues over here one is that in aerobic respiration there is a four electron reduction of oxygen to water in a stepwise fashion so there are several intermediates that are formed they are all highly reactive and toxic to microbial cells and it's only in the last reaction that you have an end product like water which is non-toxic to the microbes. So if we look at the first reaction, molecular oxygen plus an electron will result in O2 minus. This is called superoxide. This superoxide plus one electron and two protons will result in hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide plus an electron and a proton will result in hydroxyl radical and H2O and this hydroxyl radical plus an electron and a proton will result in water. So overall when you have oxygen as your terminal electron acceptor there are several steps in the process all of the intermediate uh, compounds that are produced are toxic to microbial cells. Now all the different aerobic species of bacteria as well as some of the others um, have different ways of dealing with it. We will come back to that later. So these are the toxic intermediates of oxygen that the uh, aerobic as well as facultative bacteria have to deal with and we'll come to the other groups of bacteria in a little bit. So we have singlet oxygen which I said is molecular oxygen. It is uh, basically the molecule is boosted to a higher energy state it becomes highly reactive and that's one of the toxic intermediates then we have superoxide free radicals o2 minus which is formed in very small amounts during aerobic respiration when molecular oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor next one is peroxide uh, peroxide anion so O2 2 minus which is not shown in this uh, stepwise uh, reduction uh, that is where hydrogen peroxide is produced and finally we have hydroxyl radical which is the most reactive form of re uh, oxygen and that is formed by ionization uh, ionizing radiation now uh, the fact that these toxic intermediate species are formed whenever oxygen is present in the environment, those uh, microorganisms including bacteria that are capable of utilizing oxygen have enzymes for destroying the toxic oxygen species. So let's take a look at a few of them. So we have catalase and peroxidase. These are perforin uh, containing proteins. Catalase is present in aerobic as well as facultative bacteria, aerobic bacteria and it has the ability to convert hydrogen peroxide to oxygen and water. Then we have peroxidase, uh, again hydrogen peroxide along with NADH and a proton will, get, will give you water and NAD+. The next one is superoxide dismutase and this one in combination with catalase is present only in obligately aerobic bacteria. So it will convert superoxide O2- minus plus protons will be converted to water and molecular oxygen. So you can see that the end products have to be non-toxic species of either water or and or molecular oxygen. The next one is superoxide dismutase. This is common to obligate anaerobes. I'm sorry. It is, uh, let me rephrase that. Superoxide dismutase is common to all bacteria except obligate anaerobes and microaerophilic bacteria. So you have uh, two uh, molecules of superoxide plus two protons will result in hydrogen peroxide and molecular oxygen and the last one is superoxide reductase this is 
are present in some obligate anaerobes, they use this particular enzyme to convert superoxide to hydrogen peroxide. But since they do not tolerate oxygen, this superoxide reductase is able to convert superoxide to hydrogen peroxide without generating oxygen. So, it uh, gives you cytochrome uh, C which is in the reduced form is oxidized and the end product is hydrogen peroxide which can then be further uh, detoxified by uh, other enzymes. So, here is an example of the positive catalase reaction. If you want to know whether a particular organism is, uh, does it have catalase enzyme or not, there is a very simple test that is done for it. It is done by placing a drop of hydrogen peroxide on a microscopic slide. An applicator which has been touched to the colony of the microorganism that you want to test for is picked a little bit of that colony is picked up on the applicator stick. This is the applicator stick and the tip is then smeared into the hydrogen peroxide drop. If there are bubbles or froth, then the organism is considered to be catalase positive. And if the organism, if there are no bubbles, if there is no froth, the organism is considered to be catalase negative. How do we culture anaerobic bacteria? Now that becomes a major challenge because our conditions, our environmental conditions are fully aerobic. We have ample oxygen in our environment and therefore uh, whatever we culture here is generally aerobic bacteria and other microorganisms. If I want to cultivate anaerobic microorganisms, I need a different kind of setup. The simplest, crudest way of doing it is you take a glass jar, put a candle along with the uh, media, whether it's solid media or liquid media, you put all of them inside a glass jar, put a candle along with it, burn the candle, after, uh, burn the candle, seal the jar and after some time all the oxygen inside the jar will be consumed by the flame and you will get anaerobic conditions. So, it's a basic very crude way of doing it, but it's uh, neat and uh, perfectly clear. That is the first one. The second one is an anaerobic jar. I will come to that later. What we see here is an anaerobic chamber or an anaerobic glove box. In the anaerobic glove box, this is an inflatable device. So, it's generally made out of transparent plastic. It can be uh, much bigger than what is seen in the photo over here. Regardless, it's mounted on a table, on a very large table. It's connected to an airlock, which is connected to uh, gas cylinders. Different gases are used. I'll come to that one point after another. Um, so, the first thing is that you open the airlock and place whatever materials that you need for culturing and incubating in the glove box. So, this is the glove box or chamber in which all the materials have been placed. The airlock is, all the air from the glove box is then withdrawn through the uh, airlock. As the air is withdrawn, nitrogen gas is added to the glove box. So, it remains inflated, but now it is a nitrogen containing atmosphere. So, there is no oxygen because anaerobic means no oxygen and nitrogen gas is inert. So, this is our inert oxygen free atmosphere that has been created within the glove box. And uh, these gloves, there are gloves on the outside where the person who is uh, going to work in the anaerobic glove box can put in his or her hands and manipulate all the objects that are inside the glove box. So, this is a very, uh, it's kind of difficult and it can be done and this is how uh, you can do large scale experiments with anaerobic conditions. I then come to anaerobic jars which is for small scale experiments using jars. So, in the first case you inoculate the agar plate with whatever anaerobic bacteria you have, place them in an anaerobic jar. An indicator strip is part of the jar. So, these are commercially available setups and they are generally saturated with methylene blue. You add water to open the gas pack that is part of this package 
the entire thing and it will cause the release of hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide and that has to replace the original air that may be inside the um, anaerobic jar. You can then incubate it at a particular temperature and check the indicator strip for any color change. These are examples of membrane filtration. I think I've already shown these uh, to you and I will stop at this point. Thank you.